do go to church. You know, I believe in right and wrong. Pardon me? You said someone said something to you that was kind of nasty at the time, a warning to you. Yes. Uh, uh, it was Attorney Scott Quito, and he's with Paris, Paris T I E R C E, and Associates in Chicago. He said, Mine was the first case he ever lost in 13 years. And he said, You're a lay person, you're not even an attorney. And he said, it's, It ain't over. And he said, Ain't, you know, I knew he knew uh, better grammar, but he said, It ain't over. We all know where the problem begins and it's on Wall Street. They'll step on you, excuse my French and everything, man, right? They give you a golden shower, but that's be all you get. America's going down the tubes and it's because judges lack the intestinal fortitude and honesty of people like Judge Arthur Shack. This is a long movie in 13 minutes. Watch all of it. It's worth it. And that's what we get all the time out of these courts. And a lot of times, honestly, to tell you the truth, I think it's because of the fact that the, their pensions and the CAFR accounts are tied to these mortgage-backed securities. And, you know, there's, it's so hard to fight this kind of thing. It really is because without them following proper procedures, especially Rule 15, that's fundamental. Without amending their uh, original complaint, because the new complaint takes precedence over the old complaint. Yes, and for, and for them to, they keep discovery away from you. I have a situation now where we're trying to get a payout from a gentleman so he could put actual money in escrow and force them to produce the note. He calls the bank, and guess what they do? They refuse to give him the payout amount, the payoff amount, plus 30, you know? And I, as I say, I was a title insurance producer. This is what banks are supposed to do, but yet every day they violate the public trust, and they should be in prison. Yes, and... and one thing, though, without the court's help, they cannot do this. Right. So, uh, even if you are pro se, you should be afforded all the proper uh, things that... Well, folks, we're here with KingCast.net, Mortgage Movies, and another scumbag foreclosure mill. Uh, we're not in Boston today. We're in uh, Peoria, Illinois. And apparently, corruption plays in Peoria, Illinois, just as it does throughout the country. Now, uh, they... Pearson Associates have been sued before, and they tend to get away with it. You know, that's just one of those things that's happening in America. Now, uh, Malcolm X said, we are not violent with people who are not violent with us. Now, I'm not going to get violent with these people, but I am going to shoot them with a cannon for what they did to this woman. It's hard to find a strident, talented, and uh, forthright attorney to go after these people, and it's hard to find mass media, major media, that's going to really tell the truth about these fraudulent foreclosures that uh, have no basis in law, fact, or equity. Um, I'm here. Uh, I've been a state attorney and a licensed title insurance producer, and, um, you know, I'm going to tell the truth. That's, you know, that's what I do. <laughs> We're here with KingCast.net, and I'm with Donna Gaston. Ms. Gaston is a litigant in the case of Gaston versus National City Bank. That's right now pending in Illinois uh, Central District Federal Court. Now the issue is, well there are many issues here, but tonight we're just going to be doing an introductory uh, interview to get people familiarized with the issues in this case right here, which is case number uh, 11 Civil 1057. And it appears, from what I'm seeing, that they, the court has basically, on this foreclosure case, has uh, denied your motions for reconsideration. You've, you know, you're on the road to being set out of your house, even though you were timely on your payments. So, uh, Ms. Gaston, uh, briefly, uh, what's your background like? What year were you born? Uh, May 9th, 1940. So you're about my parents' age, and instead of relaxing in your home, you're fighting foreclosure and being put out on the streets. So tell us how this happened, and uh, just give us a quick rundown here uh, at the very beginning. This started in 1999 uh, when National City took over First of America Bank. The first time they filed a foreclosure was in November of 99, even though the bank manager told them that she had taken my payments. So that case went on through the summer. And when, even after they found the payments, they didn't admit it until Judge Freeze 
told them that if they didn't come up with something, he was going to do an audit on the bank. Okay, now this this was in this was in state court, right? Right. This was in the Eleventh um, Judicial Circuit Court in Bloomington, Illinois. Okay. So then that case was closed, and I was reinstated with everything just. With, you know, no charges to me. I didn't have to pay any court costs, any attorney fees, or anything because the judge said nothing was my fault. They were totally wrong. Okay. So then in 2001, my daughter and I was in an accident, a car accident, and so I just asked for a little time to transfer money. But they um, filed a second foreclosure case against me. And what happened to that? At that time, it was still in the 11th Judicial Circuit Court in Bloomington, Illinois. Okay. But there was another judge on there. There was Judge Prell on there. And he said, Mrs. Gaston, it's unfortunate that they wouldn't work this out with you, but it was in their rights to file the foreclosure. And I said, I agree with you, Judge Prell, but the thing I don't agree with, they're trying to insert the charges from the previous case under net other charges and he laughed and said well let's see about that so <coughs> the, and when I caught, caught him on the fraud there they had to take all four thousand dollars for the charges so that um that was um O two C H twenty four in the in the circuit court. And what year was that? Uh, that was in Bloomington, Illinois. Uh, so what year ma'am? Uh that was in uh, 2002. Okay. And at the time, I heard, didn't you tell me somebody said something to you kind of nasty at the time, right? Pardon me? You said someone said something to you that was kind of nasty at the time, some, a warning to you. Yes. Uh, the, it was attorney uh, Scott Quito, and he's with Paris, Paris, P I E R C E, and Associates in Chicago. He said, Mine was the first case he ever lost in 13 years. And he said, you're a lay person, you're not even an attorney. And he said, it's, it ain't over. And he said, ain't, you know, I knew he knew uh, better grammar, but he said, it ain't over. So now, yeah, so now, you know what, <laughs> this is crazy, my battery's running out and, and, and I've got to get this, I've got to wrap quickly. So now you're in this case now, where basically you're in federal court, they've got your case kicked out on race judicata and, and Rooker-Feldman doctrine, and your argument is basically that, look, I could not have tried these issues before because I was seeking discovery of the fact that they would not, that they were not permitted to change your monthly payment, um, and they never gave you the discovery until after the uh, the trial court. Right, right. The discovery item I needed to prove my case, I didn't get until afterwards, and that was the official ARM payment notification letter that stated the payment changed on. March 2002, March 1st, and would not change again until March 1st, 2003. There was no legal way. They fraudulently uh, uh, submitted an altered escrow analysis. They also uh, drummed up a letter that they had that was also fraudulent to support their case. But the most damaging was their personal testimony to the fact that they could uh, to combat all the federal laws and change the payment when every single federal law said that the payment could not be changed until March 1st of 2003. I understand. And it's, it's incredible. This is what these banks are doing. They're putting people out of the houses without standing to foreclose in the first place and then getting upset at the homeowners when you, when you fight back. And this is a huge issue because there's no clear title to any of these uh, mortgages almost all the time. You know, they bifurcated the note and the mortgage, uh, illegally securitized things. The note doesn't reach the uh, the trust that it's supposed to be going into. And basically, they're using the course to launder money when you get right down to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know what I can do for you in terms of, uh, you know, getting you, trying to find you some legal help and getting your, your word out there. But in your case, I see it all the time. And I was a title insurance producer. I was an assistant state attorney. I see it all the time. And it, it, it disgusts me that someone like you was going through this. But my, my point is that Rooker-Feldman and Mr. DeCarty can... The, so Rooker-Feldman, uh, as we said, it, uh, you know, we were explaining how the, the banks basically are, are laundering, laundering money and they're, they're, they, they've never, they don't have standing to foreclose and all of these situations. Uh, and they're basically bifurcating the note and the mortgage illegally. The notes never reach the trust that they're supposed to reach. 
and uh, they are basically using the, ba the uh, courts to uh, get good title to homes, but that's even questionable under certain cases that are going on right now. Uh, but anyway, so Ruker Feldman and Rachel Dakota, in your case, go ahead. The initial complaint of the foreclosure was a single line. It's a failure to pay the October 1st, 2002 payment and the payments thereafter. That included March 2003. I produced hard copy evidence of official bank checks, not my personal uh, checks, the official bank checks that showed every one of them had been paid and accepted had been paid. So I had overpaid them. So once I did that, they began to say, oh yes, she did, but uh, there was supposed to be um, uh, two payments in October. I produced the judge's order to ch show there was no two payments. Then they uh, switched it again and said that they did an escrow analysis on October 2nd, which changed the October 1st payment. All of this was done verbally without the two-day notice, without changing the amendment to the clerk, without filing their amendment. So what they won their judgment on has never been filed before. They have never filed that there was a change of pain. Yes, I, yes. And that's insane. Uh, and yet I see things like this, all these travesties of justice all the time, and I see where the court, in its order, basically said, oh, the motion for reconsideration is nothing more than arguments she has been advancing throughout this litigation. As a result, plaintiff's motion for reconsideration is denied. And that's what we get all the time out of these courts. And a lot of times, honestly, to tell you the truth, I think it's because of the fact that the, their pensions and the CAFR accounts are tied to these mortgage-backed securities. And, you know, there's, it's so hard to fight this kind of thing. It really is because without them following proper procedures, especially Rule 15, that's fundamental without amending their uh, original complaint because the new complaint takes precedence over the old complaint. Yes, so and, for, and for them to, they keep discovery away from you. I have a situation now where we're trying to get a payout from a gentleman so he could put actual money in escrow and force them to produce the note. He calls the bank and guess what they do? They refuse to give him the payout amount, the payoff amount, plus 30, you know? And I, as I say, I was a title insurance producer. This is what banks are supposed to do, but yet every day they violate the public trust, and they should be in prison. Yes, and and one thing though, without the court's help, they cannot do it. Right. So, uh, even if you are pro se, you should be afforded all the proper uh, things that another attorney would, as long as you're respectful in court, as long as you're. Not obnoxious as long as you're following the civil rules of procedure, the federal rules, the U.S. codes, and all of the things. You're supposed to be treated fairly. They're not supposed to be two sets of laws in this court. I know, and I've read some of your pleadings, and you do very well. Uh, you do better than a lot of lawyers I've seen. So, uh, are you your your church going, a woman? Are you a church going, woman? Oh, my God. Do you go to church? Oh yes, I do. I take my granddaughters to church. We, we, in fact, we were at church uh, Tuesday when we were supposed to get your phone call. We thought we might do that by time. Yeah. Yes, I, I do go to church, you know, and I believe in right and wrong. And you know what? I'm not asking the courts to bend. What she finished saying was that she's not asking for anyone to bend the law or for special accommodations. She just wants equal justice under the law, and it's not happening.